Amen. Amen. This month, we've been actually looking at the story of Jesus. We've been in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, the whole month. Um, two weeks ago, we read the first section. Last week, we read the middle section. And today, we get to read the end, verses 18 through 27. So listen a little bit to Jesus' story. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own, because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, servants are not greater than their masters. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also but they will do all these things to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It was to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without cause. When the advocate comes whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who comes from the father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme today, we go high. John and Malcolm, and I changed the names just for confidentiality, were close cousins who felt more like brothers. John's dad was a pastor and their home was attached to the church. One night while they were home alone, they heard a noise in the church, an alarm John grabbed one of his dad's guns, and they headed over to see who and what was going on in the church. On the way there, John tripped, and the gun went off, shooting his cousin in the armpit. Later at the hospital, his cousin was pronounced dead. It was an accident, of course, and the police released him to the custody of his parents. Ironically, gun owners more often shoot people they know than strangers. But this is not a story to leverage anti-gun laws. It's a story of difference. Talk about guns in our country and the conversation can get really, really heated. Or talk about vaccinations, to get them or not to get them, and the conversation can get heated. Or to talk about pro-choice or pro-life or any number of issues and the conversation gets really heated, really hostile, almost in the way that we would echo the words of Tracy Chapman, choose today, you gotta make a decision. There is hostility. This is where we enter the biblical text. The arrival of Jesus in this new way of living was not greeted receptively by all. There have been years upon years of religious instruction as we learned last week. Kids were raised and steeped in the commandments and the laws and the rules. It was a rule for everything. The laws ordered how the Israelites led their lives and what they were to do and how they were to do it and how to prepare food and who to be with. And here was Jesus throwing a monkey wrench in the way they did things, kind of like how we did things before COVID and after COVID, before Jesus and now after Jesus. And so we find here in the text today hostility. There is tension. And Jesus puts his finger on it by acknowledging, acknowledging that there are people that don't like me. He puts his finger on the pulse by acknowledging, I have invited you to a path that will make you different, not better, because sometimes people think being different means they're automatically better. No, it doesn't make you better. It just makes you different. And well, frankly, it caused some folks to get really heated up to the point where they actually hated Jesus. By the time the Gospel of John was written, the conflict had become an open rift. 
In the word of Professor Eric Myers, most of the Gospels reflect a period of disagreement, of theological disagreement. And the New Testament tells a story, tells a story of a broken relationship, and that's part of the sad story that evolves between the Jews and Christians because it is a story that has such awful repercussions in later times, which means we have been struggling. We have been struggling to get along for a while. I imagine that Jesus was calling them to step away from the comfort of rules and what they knew. Step away from the formality of it all. They are there, and last week we reflected on them as a pathway to love, but not the end point, not love itself. The commands help us to get to love, but they are not love. They are like the bowling bumpers on a lane that keep us from what? Going into the gutter. But they are not meant to hold on, squeezing life out of us. They are not meant for us to beat people over the head. Uh, they point us, hopefully, in the right direction. They give us a starting point. But they are never, never should they be the end point of our existence. Rules help us as a spiritual compass. That's it. About a decade ago, I decided to take swimming lessons. There are rules for swimming. Seriously, there are. There are rules for swimming. First, you become acclimated with the water. They want you to understand that the water doesn't have to be an enemy. Then you go underwater and you hold your breath for a while just so you can understand that you actually can go underwater and you can survive. These are the easy steps, but then you practice just floating, doing nothing else but simply allowing your body to float. And then you get to float and move your arms, and they tell you how to make strides with your arm and how your hand should be cupping. No spaces between your fingers. Then after you move your arms, they let you kick your feet. And then after all that, you put it together and you try to breathe. But let me, let me go back. I'm getting excited here. The instructor goes over the same rules over and over again. And at some point, you must let go of the wall and put into practice what you've heard. And you must do this over and over again because you don't just do it one day and all of a sudden, kapi, you've got it. But you practice the rules over and over and over again. The rules are only there to help you to be able to swim. Each body implements them differently, but it doesn't change the rules. Similar to Christian living, we can go high and live out the commandments and go high and we can retain the knowledge or perhaps never really swim. But each of us, each of us will implement it differently. The more and more we apply the commandments, apply the rules, apply what's in the Bible, the further we go. But first a few feet and then 25, and then you make it through the stretch of the pool, and then you're able to do laps. But it starts with rules. It starts with commandments. Often, when we get into tough decisions, we rely on ourselves instead of God's manual. We rely on our own devices. Even though our own devices got us in the mess in the first place, our own limitations are why we're kind of there half of the times, but we still want to go for broke, relying on ourselves. When I was taking swimming lessons, one thing that was helpful was not relying on myself and listening to the instructor. He would bark out orders. He had served in the middle military, and so he was kind of, you know, like a dictator a little bit, but it was a good place to be a dictator. And he would tell us the same thing over and over again. And it would be amazing to watch people argue with him and give them all the reasons they couldn't do what he told them to do. And he would say to them, stop listening to yourself and listen to me. I'm the teacher. So whenever we were ready for next, I would always throw myself into what he said, period. And then he would give us feedback on how well we had implemented what he said. And my swimming got better and better because I listened to him and not myself. Imagine if we listened to God and not ourselves. In order to go high in life, it is important for us to know what the Bible says and to listen to it, not our own voices of doubt. And yes, you may be greeted with hostility. It's going around these days. So we also got high by working together. 
In swimming competitions, there's one race called a relay race. And generally, there are four swimmers that are competing in this race, and sometimes they're all doing the same stroke, or they may be all doing a different stroke. But they are as strong as the weakest link and as strong as the strongest link. What is key to this race is winning, and winning depends not just on one person, but it depends on all four people in the race. Everyone is working together, rooting on everyone that they might go high. It's the teamwork that gets the job done. Maybe you've heard that said before. I see that a lot on various committees in our church, people working together to go high and to get things done that we couldn't do by ourselves. I'm learning that more and more how important it is to work with others to go high, to get things done to work together. That's what makes us united. That's what makes us so special. Pitching in and helping out. And yes, I'm about to say we need every member. So if you're not involved, this is my pitch to you today to get involved because there are many things in our church that you could be doing. There was this female high school race that uh, me and my son saw recently. There were several schools competing together. There was this big high school and they had bleachers and they had a lawn where there was grass and there were people sitting out there watching these girls run around the track. And right near the end when the girls are coming along, uh, uh, around the last stretch of the race, some dog breaks free from its owner and enters the race. Now you have all these girls on the track and here comes this dog dashing from the side, starting in last place. But within seconds, by the end of the race, the dog shoots into first place. Amazing. I mean, the dog was in sync. He was in his lane. He was doing his thing and shot by all of them. Now, he didn't sign up for the race. He didn't follow the rules. He wasn't allowed to enter the race, but I guess he really didn't know it. And he shook things up. You see, we've been shaken up. Post-COVID has shaken us up. It came from out of nowhere. We didn't see it happening. We were living our own lives, and here comes COVID, and it shut things down. Some experts say that we will see the impact of COVID for 30 years economically. I was looking at India this morning and weeping for the devastation that has happened in that country. A senior was telling me about the loss that he has experienced. I was like, get in line. Just like the dog, we didn't see it coming. We didn't see it coming, but suddenly it has taken center. One day I was talking to friends and someone said, don't talk about COVID. And then the person got on the line because we knew that this person was feeling anxious. And what did we do? We talked about COVID. And later I scolded my friends. We weren't supposed to talk about COVID. And the friend said, how do you talk and not talk about COVID for an hour on the phone? You see, COVID is like that dog that has come and entered the race in his center. But we are coming around the corner. We're coming out of hibernation. Some of us have been vaccinated, and now even kids as young as my son can be vaccinated. Churches are opening up. Mayor Lightfoot wants to open the city up completely by July 4th. The walls are coming down, and yet maybe there's some fear that still lives with inside some of us. Maybe our own voices are overruling what we're hearing in the world. The CDC says now we can go outside and not wear our mask if we're fully vaccinated. I don't advise that, not that I'm <laughs> smarter than the CDC. As we enter this race, we have rules that are given to us, rules that help us to soar high, rules that help us to go high. What have we learned in COVID? What has COVID taught us about ourselves? What has COVID taught us about others? What are the lessons we want to take with us? And what are the things we could leave behind or let go of or get off the wall? How might the words of Jesus in this text today, how might the story of Jesus call us to a higher ethics, to go higher?
I like my GPS, but unlike others, I don't use it religiously. I, I try to know where I'm going or have an idea, you know, because GPS will get you lost sometimes. But GPS is a good way of getting your bearings, of having a sense of where you are and where you'd like to go. Like the commandments, it's good to know, but holding on to them too tightly might not be beneficial. The Bible gives us some starting points. I am the van, brand, I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me. We've been hearing that. We've been hearing about connections. We've been hearing about the love call. Also on the GPS, sometimes it'll tell you the fastest way to get there, but sometimes the fastest way is not the suggested way. I find that amazing too. Sometimes we don't need to go the fastest way. We need to go another way that still gets us to where we want to go. And sometimes there's toll roads and sometimes you want to avoid the toll roads and they give you the option. Do you want to take the toll road or do you want to go another path that you don't have to pay the tolls? And always remember, if nothing else, perhaps this is our higher calling, that there is more than one way to get to your destination. Often when I put the GPS on, it'll give me three different ways to go. Sometimes the church has been wrong in thinking that there's only one way. Maybe there's a couple of ways. Maybe the way that God is calling you is a different path than God is calling me. The higher road calls us to live into everything we know about God to be true and God's word and God's will. Kick, stroke, and do what? Breathe. The text reminds us that when we really implement the rules, we will be different, not better. And that people may not like us because sometimes light shines on darkness and light reveals what darkness really is. And people hate for darkness to be revealed. Shining our light can do that to people. Fear and hostility are not our weapons. We are deliberately, definitively, and definitively different, but not better, just different. We try to trust God and not ourselves. We take seriously this love ethic that can be found in this chapter. And we know that at any moment we could be called on to what? Lay down our lives. And when we do that, following to the best of our abilities, we do go high. Because it's not about us. It's about doing what pleases God. When we do what pleases God, we go high. So today I began with a story about guns. Again, this is not an anti-gun pitch. During COVID, during the last president telling teachers they ought to have guns, during protests and looting, guess what? Gun sales went up. They went up drastically, even though people were buying guns left and right. Churches are even gunning up. I'm surprised to learn we're not gunning up, but there are churches that are gunning up. And don't forget, some people would say that it is our Second Amendment, our constitutional right, to be able to purchase and own guns. And it's easy to purchase one. One of my friends reminded me that it's easy to accumulate, that if you started purchasing your first gun at 25 and you purchased one each year at 50, you would have 25 guns. Statistics says 40% of, 46% of American own guns. 46% of Americans own guns. I ain't going to ask you if you got yours, so don't worry. I learned from my gun-toting friends that when you shoot in self-defense, you are shooting to take someone down. When people say that cops should shoot at legs and all that foolishness, that when you're taught to shoot a gun, you're taught to take the other person down. And if they die, oh well. But the goal is to take them down. A pastor down in Texas also heard an intruder in his church. He shot the guy, but it was clear the guy was going to live. He called the ambulance and began to administer the sinner's prayer to him. The injured had a long record of burglary. Not sure what he was expecting to find in a church. Maybe, maybe this guy, after getting shot, will change his career. Maybe he'll think. Maybe he'll take the sinner's prayer seriously. Maybe we all will. We are part of the world, even if we are different. We are different, though we are not better than anybody else, and we got our issues too. Perhaps the best we can do is stay real close to God, which is what abide means. 
and ask God for wisdom like Solomon, like, God, what should I do? How should I live my own? Gun owner or not, NRA follower or anti-gun reformer, there is still a flamboyant call to take the higher road. Because like traffic in the afternoon, a lot of people are taking the low road. But there's lots of space on taking the higher road. The higher road chooses to love in the form of laying down one's life. That's what the text holds up for us. And I have been toying with that. What does it mean for us today? And it gives me some peace that if it came down to me or the life of a stranger, if it came down to the choice that perhaps I'd rather lay down my own life than take the life of another. And that is the higher ethic. Amen. <laughs>